Okay. So, this is episode two of Hackers and Hearthstone with Wilkie, who will be talking with us about what? Hello. So I'm going to be talking about uh, software archival and digital libraries. Awesome. So let me get my challenge out there. Yeah, challenge me. So we can pick our cards. Or actually, we're both playing with uh, custom decks today. Um, and that should be pretty exciting. Uh, this is actually our second trial of this because someone's internet went out last time. Uh it was mine. It always happens at the worst possible moment. It's okay. That's just how that's how it works. Yeah. So I had a really good start last time. So if I lose, it's actually yeah. still Wilkie's fault. And, and I had a I bad start. Won. So if I win, that's just because that's just how this is how it works. It's how you planned yeah. it. You actually reset your router to get a better start. I have a silly deck which requires a certain prog progression. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I can do this while we're picking our starting uh, hand. Uh huh. If you could be any Hearthstone card, what Hearthstone card would you be? As I said before, uh, I'd like to be a card with with Inspire on it. I think that would. Uh, I don't know. So you just you just think that if you have that that trait Inspire just sounds really really nice. Like that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be a person that if I see someone invoke a hero power, I make something else better. But I'm I'm probably an Annoyatron. <laughs> <laughs> probably an Annoyatron? Yeah. Because people keep trying to attack you and you just like stay there with one health forever? That's right. <laughs> Try as hard as they want. Hit me and I still I'm still there. Alright. So what can you tell us? I'm going to use the royal us for myself and potential viewers. Tell us about uh, Archival and what work you're doing with it. All right. So what I do is I do digital archival, which means I write software that will archive stuff. Now, when most people think about that. They're thinking about very traditional stuff. This is very bad for me. Um, they think about really traditional stuff, so they think about libraries, and they think about books being placed in libraries, and and uh, basically buildings you put stuff in. That's and they kind of just transition that to what a software archive would be or a digital archive would be. It's a place where stuff goes, and for the most part, that's true. I mean, there's a lot of examples of that, um, but what I primarily work on is being able to archive computation. So being able to archive, for instance, code or software or tools in a way where you can be guaranteed to run them uh, in the future. Awesome. So how do you actually achieve that? How do you make sure that you can run that in the future? Because like with software and programs and everything, it's constantly like a changing world as far as hardware goes and libraries and, you know, God forbid you lose your backwards compatibility and then you're kind of stuck with something that you have no chance of reproducing. Right, that's a big problem. That's really what's hold, held back uh, digital libraries for, you know, the, the past 10 years. So digital libraries are usually, usually what they end up being is just a place where you put media. So, so something like um, Flickr, but for as a library. So, so what I would normally do, so the problem that you are suggesting is that when I put code up into a digital library, I might be able to run it on my computer right now, my laptop, because it runs a certain type of processor and it has a certain type of OS running on it. And when I try to run it again, 10 years from now, I'm running something brand new, hopefully better than what we have now, and I can't run this old stuff. We can already see that happen. So we have games that run on DOS that we used to play, and we can't just play now. We can't run those. Just we can't just double click the executable and run them. We have to go through certain layers of virtualization and such or emulation to run them. And that's basically the solution. Um, the solution ends up being, you know, come up with the virtualization, come up with the layers you need, the emulation you need to make that to make that actually to actually work. So is it all about kind of relying on these virtual machines to create these like historical machines, basically? 
Yeah, you just build it up. So if you have a brand new machine and you're trying to simulate an older machine, you just you just stack it all up. So the virtualization. So you you could uh, you could put VirtualBox in. You put DOSBox on top of that. You can run a DOS game. And then what a what an archive ends up being is not only do you archive the source code, but you have to start now. Now you have to start archiving everything you need to run that that piece of code, and then everything you need to create the environment. So you end up archiving not just your old DOS game, but then you archive DOSBox, then you archive VirtualBox, then you archive all these layers you need to re be able to reproduce that environment. That sounds like a really complicated task of trying to keep track of all of those dependencies and trying to make sure you uh, can like account for all like the weirdness of systems. Because I remember like old games on my old computer, it was like, oh, I don't have the right sound card, therefore I can't play this. Do you remember those days? I remember those days. Those days were awful. I remember those days completely. Uh, they're fresh in my memory, just because of how much effort you went through to actually, yeah, actually do that stuff. Um, you just remember the pain, right? Yes. I really don't know. I think, uh, OK. I got this. I like that you said you were a Noyatron, and then you played in a Noyatron. Or that you probably were a Noyatron, I should say. Well, I did Mulligan for it, so it was, it was on my mind. <laughs> not, not the best. Not the best situation. All right, so to go with that point, um, is it complex? So I think that what deserves a discussion is why is that complex? That what, what made it hard to do archival when it comes to software and code? Because programming and computer science and computers in general, they're very deterministic things. So in theory, you should be able to do something once and then continue to do it over and over again. Uh, forever. But that's just not how we have it in practice. We have all of these variables that change for no good reason that prevent us from doing good archival. Um, so what's a good example of those variables? Uh, well, some of them make sense. So the architecture changing beneath you mm -hmm. makes sense because there are practical reasons to design a chip a particular way. Um, but other things end up being slightly more artificial. So, for instance, the, uh, the libraries you use and, and such end up being very hard to track, and then you replace them, and you have all these frameworks which abstract a lot. So when you swap out these abstractions, then it gets really hard to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is just simply because... Um, hmm, I'm in bad shape. Oh, you said you yeah. were doing a mech druid, right? Yeah, see the mechs? <laughs> Do you see the mechs? Look at that spider tank. It's great. Spider tank? It should be a cheap spider tank, but I can't for the life of me draw a, a mech warper, so, you know, oh well, can't use, I can't be efficient. Um, so the, the one thing that ends up being hard, uh, so, again, what Warren's discussion is why, why is it complex? Uh, and so it's complex because things change beneath us so much. Um, and the reason why is because we keep designing things a particular way uh, to, to promote a particular set of metrics. So we design systems primarily for decades to solve the sort of efficiency problem. And that's where we have, you know, we write software to be as fast as possible or, uh, or we take, take into effect or to, into account how much storage we take up. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to make things really small and really fast. And this is actually bad for archival. Because every time we make a decision which is wrong for the long term, we have to rewrite things. We have to redesign things. Mm -hmm. and every time we do that, we're changing the environment so much that all things don't run anymore. Right? Right. So does that kind of go into maybe re-examining uh, how we do change and alter things for operating systems and how we build the operating systems, potentially make these building choices easier? Exactly. So 
if we change our perspective, and I think this is a good exercise for people, because uh, we can kind of understand why we design operating systems, for instance, with a speed and storage first mentality. It's the lowest layer in our system. It's something that, you know, uh, we have to build off of constantly. Look at you, competitive spirit. And um, <laughs> if I was paying more attention, I would have guessed that. But so, oh, God. So, um, I am bad. I, this is real bad. Um, so we can kind of understand why we build operating systems that way. But I like to pose the exercise, you know, try to build operating systems from the perspective of an archive first. This is bad for me. So the idea is that don't look at operating systems as having to solve the efficiency problem. Look at it as how would you design a system from the ground up that could preserve itself over time. It doesn't that seem like counter to like all the primary goals of systems? And like that seems like a really difficult sell for people. Like, okay, no, this isn't faster, but it's I, I don't want to say like it's like timeless. It's like, hey, the system will live on and be able to run old things, but it's a little slower. Right, exactly. It's it does run counter to sort of how we've been thinking about designing things for a long time. Um, we're not designing things for preservation. We kind of design things to do it, a certain task that we need done right away uh, and to do it quickly. And we always sell things as this is faster than the the thing you had before, and this is uh, this is better than we had before by because it's you know uses less of your network bandwidth or something. We're always solving for metrics. We're never solving for, you know, what would be easiest to use, what will last the, you know, the stretch of time, uh, what can be archived. So it's, it's a problem. I mean, how would you even go about building a system in that way? I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm dead. We'll do a rematch if we have to. Oh, that's real bad. Um, all right, so if you think about systems now and what their problems are, so we haven't designed with archival in mind. So what we have now, we have Linux, for instance. So when we think about Linux package management, when we think about libraries, when we think about versioning, that stuff is not very good. So what we end up doing, you gave your little Verlock a, a, a nice little bubble to live in. Um, you did win. I, I was good. <laughs> we'll Verlock do a columns, rematch. Verlock Collins are real good. Um, yeah, so the idea is that, OK, you have Linux and you have libraries there. And versioning is really hard. So you end up. Um, saying, I want to install this version of a library, but this other program wants an older version. And you know how hard that is? That's the, that's the idea. That, that is a system that hasn't been designed to handle that. It hasn't been designed with archival in mind. It's been designed with storage in mind and reducing the amount of disk space it uses mm -hmm. and efficiency in mind because it's dynamic linking and all of that. So you're trying to pr preserve space and you're trying to make sure that uh, how how you link in code is done right, and what's interesting is we call those we call those libraries. I always find that really fascinating. It's like we we have stolen this term, and then implemented it really poorly. And archive is the same way. It's like well, we we have this term, and we just implemented a very very much a subset of what that term actually means. So, but wasn't the historical name given to libraries done so like out of uh, Grace Hopper's statement about like reusable code and calling that libraries? Wasn't she yeah. kind of like the, the one that coined that initially? Um, but yeah, it does. It does kind of, I mean, computer science as a field in general has a tendency to bastardize uh, a lot of words from other 
like areas of expertise. Yeah, but when Grace Hopper was using it, and people within that era were using that, they they did they actually meant it for what it was, what it what it was. Mm -hmm. They they actually literally meant you would have a place with people called librarians that would uh, they would know what the code is. They would they would actually store the code for you, and you'd ask them, "Do you have some code that like I don't know computes whatever?" And they'll be like, "Yeah, we have that. Here it is, and here's how you'd use it." They actually literally thought that was what was going to happen. So are you kind of taking that idea back by oh. like implementing the archival, like you have like a a way of kind of pulling back these sort of idea that the librarians are being like, here's this old chunk of code and this is how you run it. That's right. So uh, that would be ideal. So that that's sort of what an archive or library should be. So if we put code in there and then we described it and we said, this is what it does, I can guarantee that it runs forever, whenever you might need it. That would be the ideal library. That would be a, a true software library, right? And actually a place where you store code that runs, that librarians can point you to, that kind of thing is sort of is the ideal state. Um, do we want to do a rematch with basic decks or different decks? Oh, no, you can keep your deck. I'm going to do silly decks and lose. It's fine. OK. All right, I'm going to try again. We'll see if this Paladin works out again. If it does, I'm just going to go and try and see how many ranks I can get after this. Do it. Murloc Paladin is a lot of fun. I just like the, the custom Paladin lady. Yeah, I need to do that. She's super cool. I need to get that. Yeah, just level 20, and then you can do it. I don't like going first. I don't like going first. Me neither, so I'm glad you are. So again, the idea, that. So again, the idea is to uh, design systems uh, archival first. So how we would do that, uh, to go back on this, you know, if we were designing Linux from scratch and we didn't care about efficiency or storage, how would we design it? And so we could easily just create a system that preserved everything that was ever on it. So uh, every library you install, it would preserve that version there. If you upgrade, It'll, it'll have two copies. It'll have the old one and the new one. And programs can use either. And that way, things kind of gracefully evolve. And that's the kind of idea. So if you've designed systems without storage in mind, you'd have, you'd, you'd have a situation like that, where Linux is traditionally very bad at doing versioning like that across the system. So that's the kind of thing that if, you were, if you're thinking about libraries and archives first, you, you tend to, to build more versatile systems, right? boss systems. Yeah. And I'm not even sure optimization for space is that huge of a concern anymore, considering, like, if you strictly have a machine that's just running computation, you're not going to run out of space installing a lot of versions of, of different libraries and stuff. Like, that's not going to be a huge space hog on a system. You could probably do as many of those as you want. Right. You're playing a rogue. I am playing a rogue. I switch. I'm uh, playing my dragon rogue. Oh, OK. I was hoping it was the mill rogue. <laughs> no, I'm not good at mill. Um, so what kind of drove you to push forward with this archival work and start doing the research and work to kind of get the software archival thing up and going? Well, I'm primarily interested in, in the scientific reproducibility. So the ability to, if, for instance, if you're, so researchers will use software these days, right? They'll use computers, big clusters, to do data analysis or data filtering, or even traditional computer science research. They'll use hardware, the right code, they'll publish their papers. And interestingly, you know, when they publish their papers, they don't, typically publish the code with them. This yeah. is a kind of problem about accountability that I, I wish to solve. So I wish to, that people can do research with computers in a way where, one, they are promoted to publish their source code and exactly how they, done, how they have done their experiments. Two, be able to repeat those experiments by capturing the code and how it is, has been executed. And three, preserve that for uh, decades, a long stretch of time, so that 
30 years from now, you look at this paper, you can click a few buttons and run the same experiment all over again. See if you get the same results. Yeah, that seems really important for anything that wants to kill itself with science is like being able to reproduce. And it's always shocking to me that, you know, like reading papers or something, they're like, we wrote code to do this. Here's a math equation that's involved in it, but our source is not available anywhere. And right. it's, it's like, what good does that do anyone? <laughs> you could just share that, but you're opting not to because reasons. Exactly. But do you think like that would actually encourage people to want to share their source code? Like I always had the feeling that people opted not to because of like weird proprietary reasons or the fact that everyone's getting funding from DARPA that they don't really want to share their source code. And that, that's going to be the case for a while, I think, too. And even in, in the scientific community, even though most people, the vast majority of scientists want open uh, research and open code, as long as they're not working with industry or have an NDA, mm -hmm. they think, you know, to not open your code is just a grievous error. And furthermore, uh, so we're seeing even the even the people on the on the fringe don't really know or say no to that change their mind or be kind of pushed to by the rest of the community. Uh, in the beginning of this year, 2016, they passed an initiative. The federal government is is uh, actually enforcing this so that you, if you get federal funding to do research, you have to make it open access, which includes for includes your code, mm -hmm. right? There's a there's a case in there. Is you have to you, sh you have to publish your code. You have to publish your papers in an open access way. Uh, it has to be available to everyone because you know the public paid for it. Right. So, it's kind of like one of those things where like why did that take so long? Because the public was paying for all this stuff, but I mean, meanwhile, you know, like God forbid you download some papers because they don't like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of pushback on that in the recent years, right? We, we've seen it from Elsevier and um, publishing companies there where scientists were petitioning against them because they, they charge too much or, you know, they end up sort of monopolizing the research industry. Yeah. So there's been a lot of pushback on that and the government has, has noticed that and, and pushed for that because it is kind of, it's hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So your research is done through the university, correct? University of Pittsburgh, yes. Um, and do you mm -hmm. have a funding source for that? Is that one of uh, like, it's, uh, how it's do you afford the, to do it? it yeah, it's, it's funded by the NSF. So. Okay, and the project's called Occam. It's it's our software archive. Interesting and. Are they interested in like using that for? Because it seems like something would be really useful for like the Library of Congress. Has there been any talk at all for using it there and that kind of archival, so you can archive programs in addition to like everything else that they archive there? Because I mean, they archive Twitter, so I feel like <laughs> computation yeah. is kind of important. Exactly right. I'm out of cards. This is not going to bode well for me. Now you're top decking. Yeah. Let's go. Big money, no whammies. I can do this. Oh, no, I can't do this. <laughs> oh, God. It's only a 6'6". Six, six. It's not a 9'9". Nine, nine. Uh, but, yeah, no, I would love to see more of these active archives, which means they're archives that you can use to, you can put things in, but you can also take things back out, create something new, and put it back in. I want to see more of that. So we have a lot of archives which are static, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they just they just hold things, and that's it. So um, I would like to see sort of my work and, and similar work get get pushed up into something bigger, like the Library of Congress or the ACM or any of these digital libraries. And there's been a lot of interest in that, especially in the research communities. There are a dozen or so different archives related around scientific work. A few of them, like mine, can do interaction or can um, do virtual machines and such like that where you can actually run the code. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of interest, a lot of articles about people who want this, and there's a lot of interest in, in sort of pushing those up and making those the new digital libraries. 
So instead of just metadata plus a file you can download, mm -hmm. you'll be able to click a button and run something. Internet Archive has something like that. You know, it's it's really great. Yeah, the Internet Archive, I recall being able to um, play the original uh, uh, Oregon Trail because I was uh, like making my clone of it. So I was like playing through it to try and get a feel for how the menus all work so I could kind of right. make it feel more like that. But Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fun. Um, and that's client side. So they have a JavaScript emulator, right? So that's a really interesting way of doing it. So you can do it all on client side. So you basically go there, you download a JavaScript version of DOSBox, you download a binary of Oregon Trail, and you can run it inside your browser. Yeah. Right. That's really cool. I actually work on the server side of that. So the Occam project can, what it does is it takes your object, which represents whatever program you're going to run, so Oregon Trail, mm -hmm. right? And it's a, you just capture the metadata that says run this executable in a DOS environment. And what it's going to do is it's going to, without any knowledge of how to actually run it, it's going to figure out how to build a virtual machine with all of the components inside that can eventually run it from your native machine. So it just figures out, well, you know what I need? I need something that creates a DOS environment. So I'm going to put DOSBox in there. And I'm going to wire it all together for you, create this virtual machine image. It's either going to be a Docker image or a VirtualBox image that you can just run. And then, oh, you want to run it in your browser? Well, I'll send a little helpful hint in the inside that says, well, put something in that can can enable that. So put a VNC server in there, right? Your poor server hand recruits. I'm just going to keep killing them. Yeah, I know. And I'm going to keep getting more because <laughs> what I can do right now. I, don't, I never drew a dragon yet. This is really bad. You're going to win. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, yeah, so Occam, my project, can can do that. So from this description of Oregon Trail, uh, it can build a virtual machine with VNC and DOSBox and an X server and run that on your server. And you can just create an instance of, of the archive on your own machine and just pull things down from a larger one and spin up a virtual machine on your server or whatever, on your laptop or whatever, and run it in the browser. It just does a little JavaScript VNC client. You can... You can just play the game inside your browser. It's so, really so really yeah, it, it's definitely like powered heavily by JavaScript and the fact that JavaScript is like so super powerful right now. Um, are there any concerns, like security concerns, about having like a VNC instance like running in the browser? That seems kind of. Oh, well, the the VNC server is going to run in in a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it can only see the things that were mounted inside. So it creates a virtual machine for Oregon Trail or something, right? Okay. Whatever it needs. It creates a whole machine to run Oregon Trail. And so that's going to be isolated from there. So if you can break out of the virtual machine, well, okay, then you are you might be in some trouble. But for the most part, the things you run inside are sandboxed within a reasonable environment. Uh, the VNC on the client side is just going to connect through a WebSocket. So the VNC server is just buried inside that virtual machine. Awesome. So it just kind of goes through a couple of couple of uh, networks. Uh, so give it through a local library. All the layers, all the turtles, and then yeah, <laughs> it figures it out. And it's really fast. So because you, you can run it locally. So all of those layers that doesn't slow anything down. No, not at all. No, because you can you can use either virt virtual box, uh, but you can also just run things in Docker. So you can create like a Docker container for an archive object, and it runs semi-natively, as long as you don't need to... So Docker doesn't hide all the details about your hardware. So as long as you can... Occam can figure out how to make something work for Docker, it will. Otherwise, it'll just use a, a virtual machine. Okay, so it's like a fallback just in case, like, you know, there's some sort of hardware mismatch or something that it just can't possibly do it with Docker. Right, because the, the Stanford Digital Archive people back 10 years ago, said something that I take to heart, which is, you can build an archive, but just because you build it, people won't come. It's not like that movie, whatever it was. And Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, right? You, if you build it, people won't use it. People don't want to archive things. It's too much work. They just want to do it and let it be done. So what you have to do, their approach was to build a robot, which just like stole things from people and threw it into their archive, which I think <laughs> really neat. 
call it an info monitor uh, into the Stanford vault project. But well, I, my thing is like create a tool which people want to use. For instance, something that allows them to play games in a browser or can do research experimentation directly in a, a web app so that they'll do their experimentation with a tool and it just archives it for them. So that's that's kind of my take on it. It's just build in what I call an active archive, something that provides a service to you, but also keeps track of everything. So awesome. in the background. Yeah, so it versions everything and keeps track of everything, automatically archives stuff. And then when you run your own server on another machine, just pull down the experiment that someone else made and just and just run it. You're just guaranteed to be able to run it. So it's great. Yeah, that does sound pretty awesome. And then I won't have to mess around DOSBox on my local machine anymore. No, it'll, it'll pull it down and build it for you. In fact, if it pulls down stuff from GitHub, it already archives it. So GitHub dies or goes down. You can still pull the source code. Because <laughs> it archives Git. No, no problems with the stuff. angry unicorns anymore. No angry unicorns. I don't even use... See, the irony would be if I used a uh, unicorn, but I don't. It's, it's thin and Nginx and whatever else you want, so. All right. So is there anywhere people could learn more about your research and what you're doing? Yes. Uh, so the project that, that I work on is going to be on occamportal.org. And the website for the archive itself is going to be occam.cs.pit.edu. So I'm not sure if you can type that out somewhere for people. Yeah, I'll put it in the description so they can just kind of click on links and go see what it's all about. Will it appear below me? Can I just do like, it's right here. Uh, I'm not that fancy. Oh, well. I'm not going to do, all, I, I don't like the, the things that kind of like hover below and then you like click on it in the thing and it takes you there. I find those really distracting, so I'm not doing this. Sparkly word art. All right, well, whatever. Whatever, you don't want to take that effort from me, it's okay. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's fine. So you can see a, a description, there's a blog and you off of that occamportal.org and you can read about how some of that stuff works and why it's so cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for playing some Hearthstone with me. And I, we're, we're tied right now, so I guess you yeah. have to come back again at some point. I was uh, going to say, yeah, we're one, 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 one to one. Yeah, one one right now, so we'll have to do this again. Is it possible to tie? Yes, you can draw. I haven't done that before. That'd be right. I want to try that. All right. Um, so thank you. And oh, we... You lose. Okay. All right. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Hope everyone enjoyed my rambling. It wasn't very clear or concise, but thank you. <laughs> Till next time.